All right. In this video, I want to talk about being lost on an island. Now, the reason why I'm doing this video is because I tried to engage some Catholics. And I was asking them a question about whether or not a certain Catholic could be saved. I didn't really get a straightforward answer. I got a link instead, which is something I want to go over in this video. But anyway, the scenario that I was setting forth for these Catholics was that this guy here, let's say he's a Catholic, right? And he's from America, and he's going to China on a business trip, right? But he sinned. He did a sin that he needs to confess to the priest on Monday, but he has to go catch his plane to go to China. And he won't be back until Saturday, so he's figured, you know what, on Sunday when I come back, I'll go and confess and whatnot. So he goes out on his business trip to China, and you can even say he, he sinned again on the plane, right? And then storm happens, technical malfunction, the pilot has a heart attack, you know, something happens where the plane that he's on crashes or if he took a, a boat for some reason, it goes down. But it's, you know, it, it crashes either near or on an island like we see here. So he makes it to this island with a, a few other people let's say, and he already has sin that he hasn't confessed on him, and in order to survive, he ends up lying and manipulating the other survivors, and even stealing from them, so that he'll survive, and be more comfortable on the island, and it gets to the point where he ends up even murdering them when they're weak to not only take their things but to also eat their bodies right so this guy is just adding sin upon sin now let's say he's about 30 years old when all this happens and eventually he's the only one left on the island and he learns to barely survive right he can survive it's not super comfortable, but he's going to survive on this island, and he's going to live for the next 40 years on this island by himself, with no contact with mankind for the rest of his mortal life. And then he's going to die when he's 70 years old. So I was asking, well, can this Catholic fellow be saved, or is he doomed? And there was not a straightforward yes or no. There wasn't really an engagement. Uh, the only person that really responded gave this link here. And that's what I want to go over. I didn't necessarily say that uh, is he lost because he can't confess or anything like that. But this is what they brought up. Right? And it's kind of interesting as it starts out here. Because it's talking about whether confession is necessary for salvation. It says, objection one. It would seem that confession is not necessary for salvation. This is a, from a Catholic point of view, keep in mind. Uh, for the sacrament of penance is ordained for the sake of remission of sin. But sin is sufficiently remitted by the infusion of grace. Therefore, confession is not necessary in order to do penance for one's sin. So, the first objection is saying that you don't need to confess your sin, but you do need to do penance. Right? Uh, but we got two issues already off the bat. One is what is penance, according to a Catholic. And grace. It says the sin is sufficiently remitted by the infusion of grace. It actually talks about it a bit more right here. In Objection 2, it says uh, 
Further, we read some being forgiven their sins without confession, such as Peter, uh, Magdalene, and Paul. But the grace that remits sin is not less effects. I can't say that word, so you can read that for yourself. Uh, now that it, it it was then, therefore, neither is it necessary for salvation, now that man should confess. So we see here the first two objections is saying that self confession is not needed. Right? And again, coming back to grace. Grace is something that is unearned and undeserved. And with Catholics, this doesn't make sense. Like, words don't mean what they mean. Right? When they say grace, it doesn't mean grace. Like what you read in the Bible, where it talks about God's favor. And it's a favor that is undeserved and unearned, such as you read in Romans chapter 11. And I had this up just in case I wanted to bring up some Bible verses. So let's go over to it just so you can see for yourself uh, what grace actually is according to the Bible itself. Uh, I'll give you two passages. I was talking about there's an election of Israel, of the Jews that are still saved, but by, by grace, right? And it makes the distinction here at verse 6 of Romans chapter 11. It says, And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So what it's saying here is that grace and works are polar opposites. If it's by grace, then it's not of works. If it's by works, it's not of grace. They're opposites, right? Because if you're given something by grace, it's gift. It's undeserved and unearned. But if you're given something by works, you deserve it and earned it. Such as uh, an example here is you go to a job and you get paid. You earned it. That's works. You don't go to work, but you accept uh, a welfare check. That's grace because you didn't earn it or deserve it, right? Those are two different things. They're not the same. Uh, analogy I like to use is that you come to a T-section on the road. You come up, and you can either go left or right. Now, you want to keep going forward, but you, now you got to choose to go left or right. You're not going to sit there. You're not going to go back. You're going to go left or right. Grace is going right. Works is going left. You can't go both. You can't go left, right. You can't go right, left. You either go right or you either go left. Once you're going left, you're not going right. Once you're going right, you're not going left. Right? Simple. That's how grace and works are. So when you read these things from a Catholic, it doesn't make sense because grace doesn't mean grace to them. Like they're saying sin is sufficient for your sin to be remitted, as it talks about Peter, Mary Magdalene, Paul, never confessing, but they're forgiven. Right? So, yeah, I mean, that right here is a very good point, showing you that confession is not needed. Yet the Catholic who gave me this uh, link here never really got into whether or not that Catholic by himself on the island for 40 years with unconfessed sin was saved or not. Never said if they were or weren't. Just gave this link and just... Started mocking and scoffing. I'm not going to get into what they said, but it's the typical response from uh, the Catholics you talk to online. If you don't agree with them, they're, they're still relatively reasonable until you show them with something like this analogy how they're wrong and how you're right. All of a sudden, uh, they act like perfect examples of Jesus. And that sarcasm in the sense that they start acting like demon-possessed children in the way they start talking to you, right? But anyway, uh, let's jump back to this, but let's give two witnesses, right? That's what I want to do with this is give two witnesses about grace. Uh, the next one uh, also by Paul in Ephesians. Oops, I went to Philippians. Let's go to Ephesians. In chapter 2, we see it makes the same distinction right here. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
So here we see that it's by God's grace, which is undeserved and unearned. It's a gift. So it's making that distinction again. And then it says, not of works, making it clear to you that it's only through your faith, which is believing and trusting God. Right? So, we got those two witnesses out of the way showing what grace actually is. It's the opposite of works. You can't have both. So you, have, if you have to do something to earn grace and deserve grace, it's not grace. It's a gift. So all you have to do is believe it's a gift and accept the gift. And that's what faith, where faith comes in. We have faith that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day, and that he gives us this gift of his perfect life. And we accept that by faith. That's the only thing it says here. I know some Catholics will say it doesn't say faith alone. But it all it says is on your part is faith. And not of works. So it's faith without works. That's, that's faith alone. Right? So even though it doesn't say the word alone, faith is by itself. And works are completely cut out. So... Yes, that is faith alone, just like in Romans chapter 4. It says, by faith, and the man who doesn't work, but believeth, that is faith without work, so that's faith alone. It doesn't say the word alone, but if it's just faith without works, what is it? It's faith alone. Uh, shouldn't have to be said, but apparently it does. But anyway, uh, let's continue on this. Now, these are the objections. Later on, it's going to say why these are apparently long, wrong from the Catholic perspective. So, objection three, it says, Further, a sin which is contracted from another to receive its remedy from another. This does not make sense to me. I do not know what that means. Sin attracted, contracted from another. How can you contract a sin from another? That doesn't make sense. Uh, we read in Ezekiel that the sins of the father are not going to be placed upon the son, and the sins of the son are not going to be placed upon the father. Everybody's going to pay for their own sins, not somebody else's. So what this means, I have no idea. Sin contracted from another? Uh, maybe we read on and it will explain, but... Uh, it doesn't make sense even in the context. It says, Therefore, actual sin, which a man has committed through his own act, must take its remedy from the man himself. So, it makes it seem again that somehow somebody else's sin can be put on you. Because it talks about the actual sin which a man has committed on his own. He has to do, give up the remedy. But anyway, it says, Now penance and is ordained against such sins. Therefore, confession is not necessary for salvation. Okay, objection four it says, Further, confession is necessary for, for a judicial sentence, in order that punishment may be inflicted in proportion to the offense. Now, a man is able to inflict on himself a greater punishment than that, uh, than even that which might be inflicted on him by another. Therefore, it seems that confession is not necessary for salvation. Um, I kind of like what it goes on to say here. talks about uh, you being your own judge against yourself. And like it says in this last half of the last sentence here, uh, when it's talking about yourself, it says, but should be judged by another and consequently ought to confess to him. Uh, I should have probably read the whole sentence so you know what it means here, but it says, Therefore the sinner who is accused ought not to be his own judge, but should be judged by another and consequently ought to confess to him. That's actually the wrong sentence that I wanted to actually bring up. Uh, my bad. I thought this was the section. I just briefly went over this before I started the video. Uh, there's a blooper. That's not what I want to bring up. It's probably something down here. I just assume it was right after the objections. My bad. So what we're just going to do 
Let's continue on with this here. Uh, it goes on to say, I answered that. I'm not sure what that is going into, but here's the reply to the objections. One of the things I wanted to bring up is it talks about the sacrament of penance because it was basically saying that you need that sacrament. So I was like, okay, uh, can a Catholic do this sacrament of penance while on an island? And you can see here, this is the start of it. I just went down to the very start of the paragraph here. Uh, this sentence is interesting. I was talking about how grace doesn't seem to mean what it means. It says here, it is called a sacrament, not simply a function or ceremony, because it is an outward sign instituted by Christ to impart grace to the soul. So you see here how grace doesn't mean grace. Because it's saying that it's an outward sign that you have to do in order to get grace. Well, that contradicts what grace is. Grace is unearned and undeserved. It is a gift. Right? So if you have to do something to receive it other than just accepting it, then it's no longer grace. Right? An example here is there two people going to get grace, right? Let's just use a Catholic and a Protestant, right? God offers them both grace, but the Catholic says, well, I get the grace because I did this sacrament of penance, right? And they believe because of what they did, they, they get the grace. And the Protestant says, well, I believe in the word of God that this is a gift that I don't have to do anything for because there's nothing I can actually do to actually pay for this gift. This gift is way out of my pay range where I could never buy it and receives the gift. Well, the Protestant is acting in actual grace. The Catholic isn't. One is doing works. One is doing grace. And here we see the difference between Cain and Abel, right? Where Cain thinks he deserves something that is given as a gift. And Abel is just offering up a sacrifice by faith, right? He's not offering up his own works. Well, Cain is. We see the difference going on there where God actually told Adam to till the ground by the sweat of his brow. He didn't tell him to go be a shepherd. And at this time, they were not eating meat. Other than clothing, there is no reason to be a shepherd. Right? I mean, what are you going to be eating? At that time, they were not meat eaters. They were only eating the herbs and the plants, the fruit, the vegetables, right? So when they come to actually offer up things to God... Cain thinks he's going to be accepted because he's actually doing what God said and he's offering up his works from the farm. But he's not accepted. And Abel, who is not doing what God said to do, offers up a sacrifice of a lamb. And God accepts his sacrifice. So you see here the grace and works where Cain, being a Catholic, was coming to God saying, I deserve this. Give me what I earned. And God's like, no. Because there's nothing you can actually do to earn God's favor. While Abel just had faith in the slain lamb from the foundation of the world. And God gives grace to him. And what do you see through history? Catholics slaughtering Protestants as Cain killed Abel, right? So uh, let's get back into this here. Uh, really figure out what penance is. Okay, so this first paragraph here doesn't really explain, so we're going to look at these points down here and see if it tells us. It says, penance is not a mere hu human invention devised by the church to secure power over conscience or to relieve the emotional strain of a troubled soul. It is the ordained means appointed by Christ for the remission of sin. Man indeed is free to obey or disobey, but once he has sinned, he must seek pardon, 
not on conditions of his own choosing, but on those which God has determined. And these for the Christian are embodied in the sacrament of penance. Now this is strange. Like this just rebukes the Catholic Church. <clears throat> when you sin, you must seek pardon not on your own conditions, but according to what God has determined. This is the Cain Abel thing again, right? Cain's like, I'm going to get pardoned from God based on the conditions of my work. While Abel's like, well, God said it was by the slain lamb that he clothed Adam and Eve with our parents. So I'm going to go with that. <clears throat> and here we are, right? There's nothing in the Bible that we can see Jesus Christ saying anything to do with penance. That's why I'm trying to figure out what they mean by penance, right? Because just because the word penance is not in the Bible doesn't mean it's not there. Because if it means something like confessing, uh, maybe we could look in the Bible about that. Or what is it? Like you got to uh, go to jail, you got to pay a fine. What is the penance? Like what does it mean? Uh, that's what I'm going to try to look at right here. Uh, the next point here, it says no Catholic believes that a priest simply as an individual man, however pious or learned, has power to forgive sins. This power belongs to God alone, but he can and does exercise it through the ministration of men. Since he has seen fit to exercise it by means of this sacrament, it cannot be said that the church or the priest interferes. Inter well, you can read that one for yourself. Sometimes my tongue gets twisted up. Uh, between the soul and God, on the contrary, penance is the removal of the obstacle that keeps the soul away from God. Okay, so it's telling you what penance does, but what is it? All right, let's see if it tells us with the next point. It is not true that for the Catholic, the mere telling of one's sins suffices to obtain their forgiveness. Without sincere sorrow and purpose of amendment, confession avails nothing. The pronouncement of absolution is of no effect, and the guilt of the sinner is greater than before. So it ha looks like it has something to do with amendment. They have to do something to make up for what they did. I'm not sure what you can do to make up for any sin, uh, but let's see what it says here. While the sacrament as a dispensation but before i continue uh, i thought of the thief on the cross when i was thinking this that you got to make amendment so you got to try to make it better right the thief on the cross is being punished as a thief right there's nothing about him returning what he stole paying back what he stole paying back four times what he stole or anything like that he's just being put to death right so he's not making any kind of amendment. He just admits that he deserves what he's getting and puts his faith in Jesus. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. So to say that there needs to be some kind of amendment from the actual sinner is not true. It, it, Jesus is the amendment. Right? He did the amendment. He pays the debt. Right? That, that's why he lived a perfect life. Is to give us credit for that perfect life. That's why he died for us. So that he could die for our sins. When he died, he died for all sin. Not just the sin of the people in the past before he offered himself. Or the people who were alive when he offered himself. But also for our sins. That's past, present, and future. All taken care of there at that one day on the cross. Right? So, the debt is paid. There's nothing that needs to be done. Not saying that you shouldn't make amends for things that you've done, <clears throat> but that doesn't earn you forgiveness. That doesn't wash away your sin. All right? Uh, but anyway, this next point, it says, While the sacrament as a dispensation of divine mercy fac facilitates the pardon of, pardoning of sin. So they're saying you're pardoned by your penance. So by your works, not by what Jesus did. It's by... Doing penance. So let's read more. 
It by no means renders sin less hateful or its consequences less dreadful to the Christian mind, much less does it imply permission to commit sin in the future. In paying ordinary debts, as e.g. by monthly settlements, the intention of contracting new debts with the same creditor is perfectly legitimate. A similar intention on the part of him who confesses his sins would not only be wrong in itself, but would nullify the sacrament and prevent the forgiveness of sins then and there confessed. So what it seems to be saying here is you're in debt because of your sins, so you took out a loan, you got to pay it back. And before you pay it back, you're even trying to take out other loans. Well, then, you know, the first one isn't really paid for. You might use the debt from the second loan to pay off the first one, but that's not how it works with sin, right? That's not a super good analogy because when you sin, you're put in debt. You can't go sin to end up paying for that first debt, right? But I... I I get what's being said here. The only thing is, is that Jesus paid the debt, right? To say that you have to pay the debt or else you won't be forgiven is saying that Jesus didn't do enough or that what he did didn't do anything. You still have to make up for your sin. What Jesus did was basically pointless. Like what was the point of his perfect life? What was the point of him dying on the cross if you have to make up for all your sin? Right? I, I don't plan on going through all of this, but let's just read these last couple points to see if we can find out what penance is. Like if there's a certain thing they say you have to say or do, uh, because outside of that, it just seems like you've got to make up for what you've done. I don't know if that's why they tell them to go say Hail Marys and Our Fathers, or if it tells them to go uh, partake of the... Eucharist or whatever it telling them to do, that might be the supposed penance. I, I'm not too sure, but that that would explain what it is. Uh, but that's weird because those things cannot take you away your sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So, anyway, the last point it says, Strangely enough, the opposite charge is often heard, that the confession of sin is intolerable and hard and therefore alien to the spirit of Christianity and the loving kindness of its founder. But this view in the first place overlooks the fact that Christ, through merciful, though merciful, is also just and exacting. Yes, he is just and exacting, but he took on that punishment. That's what makes him merciful and gracious. Right? How can you call him merciful is he, if he's just and exacting on you for what you did? That's not mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. If you get what you deserve, that's not mercy. Anyway, furthermore, however painful or humiliating confession may be, it is but a light penalty for the violation of God's law. Finally, those who are in earnest about their salvation, count no hardship too great whereby they can win back God's friendship. Where they can win back. See, it's all about what you do. You see, where God is your father. And this is strange, because I actually know Catholic families. And I know an older Catholic man who is very gracious to, to his family. Uh, he He's made a living working hard through his life and though his children and grandchildren would just come to him so they can get some money and use the cars or use anything from him and just end up destroying it and giving it back wrecked or never paying him back all these things he is even though he might complain about it he still helps them out, still takes care of them, and is very gracious towards them, not enacting on them what they deserve, right? They deserve to be cut off. Like, you you don't pay back? Why am I going to keep giving you more? You, you wrecked my car. Why would I fix it for you so that you can do it again? 
right? You, you keep doing these things. You don't deserve any of my affection and my help. Yet he's very generous and gracious towards his family, right? Yet you think with God, you have to jump through all these flaming hoops to earn his love and salvation. It's like you, so you think you're more gracious and loving towards your family than God is towards you. And, and it just shows the spiritual blindness. It's insane. Like they're, they, the Catholics are indoctrinated well not to think for themselves. Because you, you show them these things and they just dismiss it. Dismiss it like you're the devil. Right? And it's like, you don't think it's the devil who's deceiving you with these contradictions and this hypocrisy and this nonsense. But somebody who comes to you actually making sense, clearing up the contradictions, getting rid of the hypocrisy, and that's the work of the devil? Anyway, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, let's just look at the objections to this first part uh, that were brought up at the beginning. And then I'll end it there. I mean, there's a lot going on here. So it says objection, a reply to objection one. Just so you know, right here, confession is not necessary for salvation because of the infusion of grace. So it says here, the infusion of grace suffices for the remission of sin, but, there's always a but, right? After the sin has been forgiven, the sinner still owes a debt of temporal punishment. So you see here, you still owe a debt. Right? Jesus didn't do it all. You have to. Right? So, yeah. What, what are you going to do with that? Right? <clears throat> I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, how many people were Christians who've lived a very gracious life where their life was pretty easy. And they live to a ripe old age, and they die happy. What temporal punishment did they have to endure to pay for their sins? None. But anyway, it says, Moreover, the sacrament of grace, the sacraments of grace, are ordained in order that man may receive the infusion of grace. And before he receives them, either actually or in his attention, he does not receive grace. So again, we see here that grace doesn't mean grace. right? In order to get grace, you have to jump through these flaming hoops of doing these rituals to receive the grace. And if you don't do these things, you don't get grace. Well, then I'm not getting grace. I'm getting what I earned by my works. Grace is an undeserved, unearned gift. Right? So... They, they don't, I'm going to have an aneurysm because they're basically when you come to this T section to go left or right, they're saying go left, right, go right, left. And it's like you can't. It's just confusion. Words don't even mean what they mean. It reminds me of talking to the Catholics about Matthew uh, 1 verse, I think it's 25 is the last verse in that chapter, I think. And it talks about Joseph not knowing Mary in the sexual sense till she brought forth her firstborn son who they named Jesus. And they'll say that till doesn't mean till. It's pretty much what they'll say. Till doesn't mean till. Right? And then they'll will quote odd Bible versions that don't use English properly and they'll say weird things about, oh, she didn't have a child until her death, or till her death. And weird, these weird passages in the Bible where till doesn't mean till. And I was like, well, you've got a problem there. You're using a Bible that's not using English properly, because till means till, 
or until, right? Which means this happened, but not till the following happened, right? Like, uh, I didn't eat dinner till I cooked it. That means I cooked it before I ate it, right? Because till means actual till. Just like grace means grace. But anyway, goes on to say, this is evident in the case of baptism and applies to penance likewise. Again, the penitent expedi... Uh, I don't know, think I can say that word, so here you go, another one that you can read. His temporal punishment by undergoing the, the shame of confession by the power of the keys to which he submits and by the enjoined satisfaction which the priest moderates according to the kind of sin made known to him in confession. Nevertheless, the fact that confession is necessary for salvation is not due to its conducing to the satisfaction for sins, because this punishment to which one remains bound after the remission of sin is temporal. Wherefore, the way of salvation remains open without such punishment being ex the same word there, expediated in this life, but it is due to its conducing to the remission of sin, as explained above. So here, saying your confession is the rem gives you brings the remission of sins. This is a contrary to the Bible, as we went over with Cain and Abel. Your works didn't take away the sins; the blood of the Lamb did, right? So then we come over here. To Hebrews, I think it's chapter 10. Come down here to like, yeah, here we go. It says at verse 18, now where remission of these is, there's no more sacrifice for sins. All right, this is not the verse. Let me scan through here. All right, I have to look at. I know it's in Hebrews. I just missed it. So let's just go here. Uh, without the shedding. Okay, it's a, a chapter right before it, 922. So let's come down here. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Right? So we don't have the remission of sins without the shedding of blood, but here we have the Catholic saying, oh, you're confessing and your work of penance brings the remission of sin. This is not what it was taught by the apostles, what's not taught in scriptures, right? But here they are teaching what they're teaching. And you notice again, it doesn't really, I mean, they, they're they explaining to themselves how they're wrong, right? The infusion of grace means you don't need to do any kind of confession except to Jesus, your, yourself, and your own heart. It doesn't have to be even spoken out loud as we see with Peter, Mary Magdalene, and Paul as they give examples of people who never confessed but obviously were forgiven, right? So the response doesn't explain a thing. It ends up contradicting the Bible. But anyway, reply to objection two. It says, although we do not read that they confessed, it may be that they did, for many things were done which were not recorded in writing. Moreover, Christ has the power of excellence in the sacraments. The power of excellence in the sacraments? So that he could bestow the reality of the sacrament without using the things which belong to the sacraments. Sacrament. Okay. There, it's right there telling you that you don't even need the sacraments. Christ, apparently here, has the power to bestow upon you the power of the sacraments for the remission of sins, which they don't have the actual power to have, but let's just say they do. Christ can just bestow that upon you without you actually doing anything. Right? Like we read... Over here in Romans, 
you know, actual biblical things from the Word of God, not something that some church just kind of made up on its own. Or it says here, verse 1, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So you see how this contradicts what we read in James. To the untrained eye, that is. See, it says, if Abraham were justified by works, he could glory, like James talks about, but not before God. Because James is talking about being justified in the sight of man, right? Because we can't be justified in the sight of God by our works. Just like we're told in, uh, I think it's Galatians chapter 2, I think it is, that talks about how no man is justified by the works of the law in the sight of God. For it is evident that the just shall live by faith. And that's exactly what's being said here as we go on to verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt so we see here again grace and works are the opposite if you work for it it's not grace it's debt it's owed to you because you worked for it you earned it but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness so you see here that worketh not but him that worketh not like abel like Abraham here, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, his believing and trusting in God, is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Right? So, yeah. Let's uh, read objection three. What? Whoops, what was objection three? Uh, sin which was contracted from another. Yeah, this weird one. Let's see what he has to say about it. The sin that is contracted from another, original sin. Okay, that's what they talking about. Can be remitted by the entirely extrinsic cause, as in the case of infants, whereas actual sin, which a man commits of himself, cannot be expediated. Man, that's the tough one that comes out. Without some operation on the part of the sinner. Nevertheless, man is not sufficient to expiate his sin by himself. Though he was sufficient to sin by himself, because sin is finite on the part of the thing to which it turns. I have to look at that one. He's saying that is is finite. Adam and Eve's sin of eating that fruit was a finite, but anyway. In which respect the sinner returns to self, while on the part of the of the adversion, sin drives infinity, in which respect the remission of sin must needs begin from someone else, because that which is last in order of generation is first, and in the order of intention, consequently Actual sin also must needs take its remedy from another. So, with this being said, it seems like that Catholic on the island would not be forgiven because apparently you need the remedy from another. Yet, sinful man cannot forgive sinful man. Right? Uh, another man cannot give remedy for your sin. Jesus, who was God in the flesh and lived a perfect life, can do that, right? And uh, I know Catholics will say about John 20, about Jesus breathing on them, which wasn't just the 12 or the 11 apostles there, but somewhere around 150, 250 disciples were there and got the Holy Spirit from Jesus Christ where he said, whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whoever they're forgiven, they're forgiven. And... Uh, the issue there is that to establish a fact, you need two or three witnesses, right? So if somebody comes reading the Bible and they read a verse like the Catholics would with uh, John chapter 20, they get a passage there. If there's no other collaborating witness in the Bible to back up what that says, then your interpretation is wrong. You need at least two verses Two passages coming together 
to say the same thing to be able to establish doctrine. Jesus says this, where he says, if I witness of myself, it's not true. If I have the witness of God my Father speaking when I was baptized and the Holy Spirit fall out upon me, and John given, John the Baptist, that is, given witness of me, and the scriptures testify of me. So he's naming the witnesses to prove he is who he is. Right? That it's not just the witness of himself. So when you have that one witness that you have in John 20, you got an issue, especially when you go to 1 John chapter 1 and 2, where it talks about Jesus cleanses us of our sins in his own blood, and that when we confess to him, he is our mediator, he is our uh, advocate. It doesn't say anything about confessing your sins to John or another apostle, and that they'll have you do some kind of penance. Nothing about that. So they have an issue, right? It, it just doesn't add up. But anyway, we get an idea of the sin contracted from another. That's not actual sin. Like, what you would contract from Adam and Eve and from your great-great-grandparents and your grandparents and your actual parents is the nature to sin, Right? Let, let, like, uh, let's say a lion can live off of plants, like grass. Like it talks about in the millennium that the lion would eat uh, hay like an ox, right? So it can live off of the grass, but by its nature, especially when it smells the blood, it attack, kill, eat, right? It's in its nature to do that. It's the same thing with mankind when there's certain things that apply to your pride, your ego, yourself, such as doing works that earn you God's favor and his love and earn you salvation. The sinful flesh loves that. And it loves being above others where you can end up creating a hierarchy. I'm above others because I go to church. I go to church not just once a week, but two, three times a week. I take the sacrament every day. You know, you got all these things where I'm better than other people, right? That's just how hell is. People just climbing over one another, thinking they're better than each other. These people don't know God. They're blind. But anyway, let's just look at this last objection here. It says to objection four. So let's look back at that real quick. Uh, confession is necessary for a judicial sentence. Okay, so let's take a look at that. It says here, satisfaction would not suffice for the expiation of sin's punishment. So satisfaction would not suffice. Then that's not satisfaction now, is it? See, words don't mean what they mean. Oh, yes, you're, it, there's been satisfaction, but it doesn't suffice. Well, then how can you call it satisfaction? It's not satisfaction. If you're going to use the word satisfaction, you would have to say partial satisfaction. Right? You can't call it satisfaction and then say it doesn't satisfy. <laughs> this, this is weird how they have this fork tongue double talk where their words contradict. They're, we're halfway through a sentence and it already contradicts itself, right? It's I don't see how you cannot see that this is a forked tongue serpent talking to you here. Not me, this here, right? And it goes on to say, by reason of the severity of the punishment which is enjoined in satisfaction, but it does not suffice as being a part of the sacrament, having a sacramental power. Wherefore, it ought to be imposed by the dispension of the sacraments, and consequently, confession is necessary. Okay, so he's saying confession is necessary in penance. Yet, we have Peter, Mary, and Paul not doing that, not having the confession, not having these penance. And not only that, he says that Jesus has the power of Something. What does he call it? Power of excellence in the sacraments. 
power of excellence in the sacrament so he can just bestow the stuff upon you. So if you just have faith on him, he'll bestow it upon you. Uh, it's like the same thing these Catholics say, that you need to die in the state of grace, and then you'd be saved. So they, they think being saved is, or saying that you're saved, is presumption. And it's like, how do you figure? If we're all in prison, right, and we all deserve it, we're all condemned and we know it, and then Jesus comes and says, oh, okay, I paid your debt, I paid the bail and all this, so we're going to let you out. Is it presumption to say, hey, I can leave now and I can leave this prison, my debt's paid? Is it presumption? No, Jesus came and said, hey, I paid the debt, your bail's done, you know, you can leave, let's go. It's not presumption, right? It's believing that Jesus actually did what he said, especially when the guards come and open the door and say, okay, you can leave, then you can leave. Now, it's pride that keeps you in there and doesn't let you out because you're saying, no, I'm a tough guy. I'm going to pay for what I've done. I'm going to earn it. You're not going to just give me this. That means you're above me. That means you're better than me. And nobody's above me. Nobody's better than me. Not even God. I'm equal with God. I can pay for this and I can earn my way out of it. It's the same pride Satan has. I can be as God. And that's what uh, these Catholics have, that same mentality. I can be good like God and I can pay for sin and I can be good and perfect like God and earn my salvation. There's, no, you can't. A finite being cannot pay for something infinite, for something eternal. And ultimately, our sins are infinite. They're eternal, and only God can pay for them. It all led to Jesus dying. Adam and Eve just simply eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Didn't seem to hurt anybody else. Caused Jesus to have to die. Right? Right? You read in Genesis about God, and then in Genesis chapter 2, it's the Lord God or Yahweh God. Yahweh means behold the hand, behold the nail. So he knew right then that he was going to have to die for them when all they ended up doing was eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the only sin recorded to Adam and Eve, was eating from a tree that they shouldn't have ate from, right? What you have done, I'm sure, is way worse than that, way worse than that. I know I've done way worse than that, right? Led to Jesus dying. There's nothing you could do to make up for Jesus dying. Reminds me of a story that I'll wrap this video up with. Uh, somebody was telling me a story of uh, the Boxer Rebellion or the Boxers Rebellion. In the early 1900s, these people were coming together at a bar and they wanted to come up with a sensational story to get people to read. And while they were drinking and whatnot, they were talking over a story. And they say, well, people like things from uh, foreign places because, if you know, we're going to make a story up. Let's do something from another country. So, you know, people are more likely to believe it because they can't see around here that it's not true. So they were saying, okay, let's say China is going to take down the uh, Great Wall of China. People are like, okay, but why would they do that? So they're like, oh, let's say that they're doing it because they want to uh, reverse the image of the Great Wall of China, where the Great Wall of China is like blocking out the world. They want to take it down as an example of opening up to the world and opening up trade to the world. How can they? are like, oh, okay, that's a great story. So let's say that they're looking for uh, companies to actually take down the, the wall. So they're looking at contractors to see which one would be the best price to take down the Great Wall. And this story started off in their town, spread uh, throughout the country, even overseas to Europe, and finally even into China. And eventually even contractors were going over to China, hoping that they would be the one to be able to take down the Great Wall of China. And China was like, what are you talking about? And they had groups in China that were already very suspicious and hateful of the foreigners. So when uh, this happened, those groups looked at it as an attack from 
foreigners trying to take over and do what they want with China. So they ended up attacking all the immigrants and foreigners in their country and a lot of Christians. So it started this skirmish where countries were going into China to try to protect their people. All because of this one little lie of a story that they came up with to try to get attention and get noticed. So it, it was a story to show you that the tongue is evil in itself. And it's like a, a little butterfly effect. It, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings. And then on the other side of the sea, all of a sudden a hurricane starts, right? So it, that's how sin is. You think it's something small and insignificant, such as Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and look where we are today with the horrors we see in this world, and those are the horrors that we know about, that we see on the news, and even sometimes in grotesque movies, you we see it. They even make shows now about people who are cannibals and all this other stuff going on, and now there's these things where there's not pedos anymore, they're maps minor attracted persons or something like that and that all started from the little butterfly flapping of eating from the tree of knowledge of evil there's an infinite eternal consequence for even the littlest sin right so you can't pay for that right because once you lie to somebody that say you broke up a family saying that the wife or the husband or both of them were cheating on each other when they weren't, and it caused destruction between them and their children. Even if you apologize for that and make up for it the only way you can, you know, telling the truth and trying to reason with the, the couple and with the children, you've already caused the damage which is going to affect them and their children as they grow up and the people around them that were affected by that, the, the family of the the, the wife and the family of the father, uh, the husband there, the, it has a ramification that's going to go on, not to matter, uh, and also people aren't going to trust you, right? Even if you're sincere, I know there's people like me, when you were younger, you did things and said things that you still pay for today because people that you knew at growing up, they remember those things, whether you, you told a lie even as a child, if it was something that, you know, not like a mischievous lie, you just lied about something. Or you stole something. They still see you as that lying thief, right? Or if when you were in high school, you cheated on your girlfriend or boyfriend. That sticks. So even if you're not that person anymore and you've changed, you've matured, that's still there. It still has a lasting effect. And the only way to cover up for sin... Is not by confessing it to some man and doing some kind of penance, whether it's saying Hail Marys and Our Fathers or other such things. It's about putting your faith in Jesus, that he takes care of it. That your sinful nature and the sins that you've committed, he took that upon himself. And he took the punishment and paid the debt. Not only that, he's replacing your life, your mortal, imperfect, selfish, sinful life, with his perfect, sinless, selfless life. That's how you get saved. That's how you become born again. And when you're born again, you're not born again in the flesh, you're born again in the spirit. Your spirit is saved. Your soul is saved through the spirit, not through the flesh. Your flesh is still going to roll and die. Right? And then you're going to be later on glorified with a new body. It's all about faith. None of this stuff is actually seen. You can't prove this. You can only prove it by reading the Word of God and saying, Well, God says it, so I believe it. So, anyway, as being lost on an island, Thanks for watching and take care.